Wollt ihr das doch ausmachen? Ah, der Thorsten Wölf. Hier kommt jetzt ein interessanter Workshop. Ah. Da kommt gleich einer von Facebook. Oh, da. Hey folks, uh, welcome to day two of the 14th annual work workshop on energy efficient HPC working group. Um, on behalf of the uh, workshop committee, Dustin and I would like to welcome everyone. Mm -hmm. Today's session will be a, a two hour session, uh, a few logistics first. As always, the workshop program is on the workshop webpage along with uh, presentation materials that should be uploaded soon, including the recording in a few days. Uh, the working group website, the organizers behind this workshop is listed right here. <clears throat> Moving on, again, uh, a request to everyone, if you, if you do not intend to actively speak during a session, please do mute yourselves, and also please turn off your camera just to limit the shared network bandwidth. Uh, event time, question and answers, please use this Zoom chat box. And uh, I'd request refraining from the Q&A button at the bottom um, next to your mute options. Please do not use that button, but uh, use the chat box instead. That is the one single place where uh, moderators are requested to keep track of all the incoming questions. <clears throat> uh, so the agenda for today, to exciting sessions back to back. Uh, the first one is on water conservation in HPC. The goal really is uh, to study efficient use of water and the need for future resilience of data centers. The focus of this uh, moderated session will be to discuss the challenges, lessons learned and future planning efforts to that effect. Uh, session number two will focus on HPC modular data centers, essentially the primary goal of the session is to discuss experiences and lessons learned in planning, building, and operating HPC data centers that are specifically designed uh, up, up to specifications that are used using a modular approach. <clears throat> and then uh, we will wrap up the day with some uh, closing thoughts and upcoming working group events that will be driven by Natalie. And with that, the first session, uh, let me introduce the moderator. Today we have Susie Belmont uh, from the Energy and Sustainability Manager in the Intelligent Campus Group, out of site operations at the at NREL, right? NREL in the United States is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Susie has been with NREL for over nine years and in her current role, she leads the Smart Labs program and manages and analyzes energy, water, fuels and other laboratory consumption to develop improved processes of operations. She also works on climate resilience planning and manages end rail sustainability reporting requirements. Uh, and with that, Susie, over to you. Great, welcome everyone. I'm excited to have everybody here today. We've got um, some great speakers on this topic around water conservation. Uh, if we can go to the intro slides, Could probably skip to the second one. I, I believe Dustin is sharing the slides. Dustin? Yes.
I should be sharing the slides, sorry. I must be... Uh... Yeah, I don't see it yet. Okay, one second. Sorry about that. No problem. Susie, if you'd, if you'd like to introduce uh, the speakers at the time, um, please feel free to while sure. you pull up the slides. Yeah, when we do that, um, that's basically what my slides are, so that's fine. Ah, okay. Oh, um, yeah, no, wait a second. I, I nearly got it. Sorry it, about no, that. it looks pretty much like this slide, so <laughs> it's okay. We can just go with that. No, I have it, uh, but <laughs> okay, I have okay. to see how I can. Sorry about that. Um, all right. Yeah, now I have to. Sorry, it's like one is in my browser and one isn't, so it's a little bit somehow <laughs> I didn't. Think about that beforehand, but now I got it. So wait a second here. Yeah, there it goes. That now share my screen. Here we go. All right, is that visible? Yes, you can see it. You, you can go right to the next one there. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're fine. And maybe um, Otto, um, Dave, and Tiziano, if you can put your cameras on just so folks will see you come up in the top there, would be great. Um, so Otto uh, Van Geet is gonna be our first speaker. Um, he's a principal engineer at NREL and has been involved in the design, construction, and operation of energy efficient research facilities such as laboratories and data centers for quite some time. Um, definitely one of the experts in this field. Um, he was a founding member of Labs 21, which has now become Smart Labs um, and helps to lead data center efficiency efforts um, throughout the federal government um, and across across the, the world really, um, and has a lot of breadth and, and depth of experience in this field. So we'll be talking a little bit about optimization strategy, strategies as it comes to water. Um, David Martinez is an engineer uh, program project lead um, at the Sandia uh, laboratory, um, focused in the, the corporate um, computing facilities. Um, he is an expert in data center operations, has a lot of in-depth experience, um, particularly with the HVAC controls and mechanical and electrical systems um, related to running high-performance computers. Um, he's been consulted and many times um, for his experience in data center management um, and energy efficient operations and designs. And he'll be talking um, a bunch about the thermal siphons that they've got down at Cindia National Lab and, and how they utilize those um, for water savings and operations for their computers. Um, and Tiziano Bellotti um, is the Associate Director for Facility Management at the Swiss um, National Supercomputing Center. Uh, he supports the center's development strategy, um, works on maintenance, renovation, um, and extension of the center's installation and buildings. Um, he helps to define the center's facility requirements for IT procurement projects as well. And he's going to be talking in depth about the, the water system and the um, challenges, the upcoming challenges, the lessons learned that they've had um, using alternative water sources for their supercomputing. You can go to the next slide. Um, so just a high level overview, um, when we talk about high performance computers, obviously lots of focus on the energy, um, which makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, one of the things that I think is growing in, in focus um, as supercomputers grow is the amount of water um, that we have to use to cool these systems. Um, and so some of the pieces I wanted to, you know, make sure we're hitting on today that our speakers are really going in depth on um, are things around, you know, efficiency. So what are techniques and things that we can do to manage water more efficiently? So we've, we've got to um, find a way to cool these systems. A lot of that is using water. Um, some ways we can do without water, um, but trying to figure out what we, what we can do to really be um, efficient in how we use water, just like we t think about efficiency and how we use energy. Um, on the technology side, so this picture of a, of a thermal siphon that we had um, at the National Renewable Energy Lab on our um, supercomputer, um, and really thinking about innovation and technology, what are some of the options out there around conserving water? Um, as we all know, there's a lot of, depending upon where you install these systems, um, various 
parts of the world really um, have regional water stress concerns. Um, and so the location really matters when we're talking about water consumption, water quality too. Um, what, you know, those are uh, big implications for um, the impacts that we can have in the communities where these systems are located. Um, as we know, there's a lot of climate change, um, things are shifting, and that means water availability, water quality, um, temperatures, all of those things can can be shifting um, in the places where we've installed these these systems. And so that's something we need to take into account as we think about where we're headed um, for water management into the future. Um, and then alternative water. So what options are out there besides using um, potable water sources? What non-potable, what alternative sources are out there so that we can um, keep these systems up and running? So our three presenters today are going to dive in depth into a bunch of these areas and topics, but I wanted to just set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have our, our three presenters speak. And if you've got questions as we go, um, as Sid mentioned, please put those into the chat. Try to avoid using the Q&A. Um, and when we get to the end of each presentation, we can have a couple of questions. And then at, as we finish all three, we can dive in um, to any further questions that folks may have. So I'm gonna hand it over to Otto. Um, if we can pull, Torsten, if you can pull up Otto's slides. And very excited to have you all here today with us. Yep, there should be nearly there. Okay. Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you, Susie, and um, uh, thank you, everyone. And and again, I'm Otto Van Geet, an engineer here at the uh, at Enrel, and we're located in uh, Golden, Colorado, which is the far west end of Denver. And, and uh, where we're located is, is kind of a high, cool, and dry climate. Um, so, so water and water use is important to us, uh, as it should be to everybody. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about optimization strategies uh, related to that for, for data centers as a whole, and then specifically how we, we view this here at NREL. Uh, on this slide is just a couple pictures. The one on the bottom right you just saw from Susie about a thermal siphon. I'll briefly touch on that technology and then my uh, colleague and friend, uh, Dave Martinez, will talk a bunch more. And then the upper image on the left is our um, uh, data center, uh, about 10,000 square feet in US units, uh, about four megawatts of current operating HPC with an ultimate build-out capacity of up to about 10 megawatts. And then the bottom left is a view of our mechanical room, which is directly below the data center. And with that, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and dive in. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, and you guys have all seen this before. It's from my friend, Mike Patterson, uh, formerly of Intel, but just talking about um, uh, the PUE family of metrics. And I'm gonna um, dive in a little more. This is a familiar topic for everybody, so I'll go quick. But the foundation is obviously PUE. Uh, from the PUE, you can get to uh, uh, ERE, energy reuse effectiveness. Uh, I'll talk about that. Uh, ITUE and TUE, I won't talk about that. Um, and then um, that's on the energy side. On the sustainability side, which is more today's focus, you can talk about carbon use effectiveness, CUE. But I really wanted to talk today about WUE, and I'll, uh, I'll use that term uh, quite a bit, and I'll develop uh, or show the uh, formulas for these on the uh, next slide, if you could go there. Um, so um, uh, some more detail, and again, this is a familiar topic for everybody um, in this call, but the energy metrics, PUE, is again, uh, total energy divided by IT energy. Um, uh, that the uh, TUE and ITUE are, are related, and I won't dive into those today because um, it's not directly related to water. Uh, energy reuse effectiveness, ERE, is directly related to water because any energy we reuse, we don't have to reject out uh, to the ambient environment, uh, often with cooling towers. And it's basically uh, PUE minus reused energy on an annual basis. Uh, importantly, um, uh, sustainability metrics, um, the water I'll uh, touch on here is um, annual water use um, on site divided by IT energy. So the units on WUE would be liters per kilowatt hour. Um, that's uh, at, at the site, and that's what I'll talk about mostly today. 
but there is also a WUE source, which importantly uh, captures the uh, embodied water use of your um, electricity. Now, again, I won't talk about CUE today, but it's an important metric. And I also won't talk about uh, utilization metrics, uh, like you know, flops per watt kind of thing. Um, shifting to the right-hand side of this diagram, just to show why it's important, uh, you know, at a high level, every bit of energy we use has to be rejected someplace. Um, so our four megawatts, for example, have to be rejected to someplace. Um, most of that um, uh, goes to the, uh, the compute, the HPC in the green in the upper right. Um, uh, and that's the, uh, the IT energy. But um, the rest goes to the facility. And just to, um, uh, I like this diagram because it kind of shows how much and how important PUE is. So, you know, if you had an industry standard um, PUE, which nobody on this call has, uh, it'd be 1.6. And you can see the arrow on the uh, right-hand side of this diagram. When you get to good data centers, like all of us have with HPCs, you're um, um, on the bottom uh, moving left, the second arrow. And when you get to really good data centers, like again, a lot of us have, uh, you're um, um, that left arrow. As we get the red area smaller and smaller, that means there's less and less heat that we need to uh, reject to someplace. Uh, the image on the bottom right is our facility in, uh, in Golden, Colorado. Uh, the data center is in the middle. Um, and we uh, show this, uh, uh, the red is, is the, uh, the heat, so to speak, leaving the data center. We can try to take that heat and pass it to heating the rest of our building. Our building in this case is a laboratory facility, which draws in lots of cold Colorado air. Um, so if we can use some of that energy to preheat that air, that's a good use for um, uh, the heat from the data center. Similarly, we use it in our building to heat our uh, the rest of the building and at times export it to our campus. We're trying to uh, um, ramp that up as time goes on. I'll show you where we are as the presentation goes through. So next slide. Um, so uh, the reason I wanted to define these terms is because this is our, our view of what sustainable data centers mean. Uh, is, is um, I'm not going to read all these words, but obviously PUE, reduce the energy use, making systems as efficient as possible. We've all talked about that a lot. But the way you get there is maximizing the compute entering temperature and maximizing energy, which uh, to maximize energy efficiency. The warmer that is, the more we can uh, achieve um, our uh, cooling from things like instead of uh, chillers, towers, and as things progress from instead of towers to uh, dry coolers. So maximizing free cooling. Um, energy reuse, that's super important because every bit of energy we reuse, we don't have to reject to uh, another device like a tower or a um, thermal siphon. Um, so the way you get there is to maximize the compute leaving temperature, not entering, but leaving temperature to maximize uh, energy reuse. The higher the temperature, the more useful it is, the more we can reject it uh, first dry or first reusing it and then uh, dry. Um, uh, WUE, reject as much of the remaining heat to dry coolers as possible. And again, maximizing compute leaving temperature is the key there. Uh, and I'll skip CUE, um, but the goal is obviously 100% uh, carbon-free energy 100% of the time. Uh, next slide. So that's that's probably the key takeaway um, uh, slide from my presentations. Um, in the mix also is alternative water treatment. Uh, if if you're still doing tower-based cooling, like a lot of us are, and REL included, for about half of our cooling, um, then um, how you treat the water in your tower can make a huge difference on how much water you treat. When you get these slides, you can click on the link where it says alternative water treatment. That takes you to a, a, um, a general service administration in the US GSA as an alternative water treatment uh, program for cooling towers. And, you know, um, I won't go through it in detail, but there's significant savings depending on how you treat your water and the cycles of concentration that you allow your tower to build up to. It, it can end up reducing your water use 25 to 50%. So it's it's an often forgotten part, but for towers, maximize um, 
the cycles of concentration. So next slide. Um, so so now kind of big picture. Um, you know, um, uh, this is a, a slide from the, uh, the U.S. has a program called uh, ARPA-E. Uh, it's uh, an energy research program uh, that's part of the uh, Department of Energy. They currently have uh, a very exciting program that myself, that NREL and Sandia are involved in called uh, Cooler Chips. Um, and, and this diagram is just an example that if you had cooling tower water or cooling data center cooling water of 10 degrees C or 50 degrees F, um, you'd have a lot of water usage and it varies depending on um, uh, your climate. Uh, the chiller energy use would also go up. You can't make this water without a chiller. So that's the image on the left. And the image on the right is uh, the warmer your climate, the more you'll have to um, use water. So that's water usage at 10 degrees C. Um, and it's obviously very significant. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I won't read you all the numbers there, but there's potential big savings. If we can conceptually um, uh, change this um, set point from 10 degrees C to 65 degrees C, much, much warmer, you know, 150 F, um, our uh, chiller usage goes to zero. We can always make this uh, uh, without a chiller, pretty obvious. And our water usage goes to zero because we can also do all of our cooling with dry coolers anywhere in the country and arguably anywhere in the world. Um, so, so the goal of this program is to uh, enable technologies to um, achieve warm water, very warm water, uh, say 60 or 65 um, uh, C um, cooling water. Uh, and it's, it's a program that's kind of chips to systems. Uh, so how to, how to um, allow warmer chips to operate. Um, again, uh, I won't read all the text on here, but you guys, uh, Take, the takeaway is uh, that the cooling tower, uh, the entering cooling water temperature is really, really a big deal for water usage. Next slide, we'll kind of build on this. Um, so, so at NREL, uh, our approach to this has been to um, uh, kind of have a hierarchy of heat rejection. Uh, so this is a snapshot in time um, from a few years ago of um, how our, our uh, system works. Uh, we're, we're essentially, uh, we're chiller free, obviously, um, primarily uh, direct to liquid cooling. Uh, these numbers have gone up since I put the slide on, but the percentages are similar. Um, we do uh, coming starting on the uh, right hand side, we, we produce water at about 70 Fahrenheit. Um, I'll use the Fahrenheit numbers, but the C numbers are on here predominantly. Uh, we have some legacy air-cooled systems that, that really dictate why we have to keep it at 70 or so Fahrenheit, um, but they're about 5 to 10% of the load. Um, and then uh, we, we uh, cool that, re-inject that heat back into our cooling loop, so it boosts the temperature a little bit, 277 Fahrenheit in this case. Um, then the water goes over, goes to uh, CDUs, and then goes to uh, direct to liquid cooling of our flagship systems, uh, which which are currently uh, HBE uh, Cray, 100% um, direct liquid cooled uh, using using warm water. Leaving that in this example, it's 95 or so Fahrenheit. Um, go out, uh, we go through heat exchangers and then reuse heat for our building and our campus. Um, when what we can't use for that. Uh, and in this diagram, we brought the temperature from 95 to 91 with heat reuse. Then we reject it dry to a thermal siphon that, uh, that Dave uh, will talk about a bunch more. I'll introduce in a few slides. Um, and then leaving that in this example, we're down to 85 Fahrenheit. And right now we have to do the rest of our cooling with a cooling tower to bring it back to that uh, 70 Fahrenheit. So, so it's a hierarchy uh, using the highest heat first for heat reuse, then dry, then wet, um, uh, dictated by, unfortunately, uh, our need to uh, uh, cool the air more so than uh, the flagship systems. Um, so, um, uh, the, and, and it varies over time. I'll show you some results based on the season, how much heat we can reuse, obviously. All right, next slide. 
Um, so, so a result of a um, paper that uh, uh, Susie and myself and another colleague, uh, David Sickinger, did a, a few years ago on, on um, uh, how this is all working, we, we implemented uh, in a, a cooperative research and development agreement with uh, our colleagues at Sandia, uh, the first thermal siphon um, here at NREL and um, uh, documented its use. I'll show you some of the savings in an upcoming slide. But for, with the thermal siphon and heat reuse, between those two, we can uh, cut our water use in half. You know, um, we could do better with the heat reuse, but on an annual basis, it's about 11%. Uh, and then the thermal siphon uh, during this time period was 42%, and then the cooling towers, the, the remaining. Uh, during this period, we also uh, measured um, uh, load. It's, got, it's grown a, a bunch since this time. Um, but it uh, was, you know, megawatt or so. PUE was 1.03 and the ERE um, was uh, uh, 0.9. Uh, the diagram on the right-hand side is, is interesting. It's, it's the WUE diagram. Um, and um, uh, yep, feel free to add uh, questions. Um, in the WUE diagram, um, the, uh, the uh, yellow is um, site water usage. The overall height of the bar is the uh, heat rejected. The uh, the green hash uh, uh, squiggle pattern is what heat was reused. And then the blue was uh, what was uh, rejected uh, to uh, thermal siphons. And as you'd guess, the thermal siphons do most of the work when it's cold in uh, Colorado, the, the fall, winter, and spring months. But in the summer, it gets um, um, high, the temperature gets too high for for those conditions and we end up having to use cooling towers more. Uh, and the uh, um, the data on the bottom is the site and source for um, WUE numbers. Uh, we um, uh, we also um, uh, do about 10% on-site photovoltaics related to uh, this load, um, 720 uh, kilowatts. Um, and that cuts the WUE source because you're using uh, carbon-free energy as opposed to grid energy from uh, 5.4 in this case to uh, 4.9. Um, uh, yep, thanks. And then next slide and I'm almost done. Um, this is a, a nice diagram of over the years since we implemented the uh, thermal siphon, um, uh, the savings. The savings are uh, millions of gallons. Um, we unfortunately had to remove the thermal siphon um, uh, this past year, but it um, it ran through early 2023 and saved millions and millions of gallons of water and um, um, lots of dollars in um, uh, operational costs because we run the thermal siphon when it makes economic sense, kind of competing the added energy use against the water saved. And that's a good concept. And, and the uh, success story here is, is, is it worked great? We demonstrated the technology and our colleagues at Sandia have implemented this on an even larger basis for their even larger data centers. And then we'll go uh, to the next slide. Um, a couple really fast uh, US inspirations and world inspirations. Uh, and I'll go through these quickly. Uh, the US doesn't do a great job yet with implementing waste heat. But there's a nice example, when you get these slides, you can click on it, but about a five megawatt data center in Seattle um, that uh, reuses heat uh, to heat an adjoining building and campus. And then um, uh, it saves money in doing it and uh, obviously water and uh, carbon emissions. And then uh, the real flagship, uh, go to the next slide, is our uh, colleagues in Finland uh, at CSC. Uh, for the Lumi uh, computer, and, and uh, hopefully they're on this call. But uh, that's the real direction that we need to go. Um, there was a nice example yesterday from Dresden, from uh, Ivana, um, but uh, they use 100% renewables at uh, Lumi um, uh, to uh, power their data center and then uh, capture almost all the heat uh, to heat the uh, uh, district there. Um, so really impressive um, inspiration for all of us of where we want to go with this. And then next slide is the last slide, and that's my contact info. And thanks, and I'll pass it back to Susie. Great. Thanks, Otto. Um, we did have one question in the chat. Um, at what 
maximum inlet temperature does the supercomputer run in the summer? Yeah, and, and that's a really good question. And, and to rebuild our data centers, we'd actually decouple, this is a longer answer, but we decouple the air-cooled uh, legacy stuff from the water-cooled um, stuff, which is 95% of our load. Um, um, our water-cooled servers uh, can run at 90, uh, essentially uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit inlet temperatures. But what drives us is we still have to produce 70 degree Fahrenheit water to, to cool our legacy air cooled. So, so in the future, uh, it could be future talk, we would conceptualize doing more, more like our colleagues at Sandia do and have a, a, a really warm water cooling loop, call it 95 Fahrenheit for direct liquid cooled compute and a, a much smaller air cooled loop. Uh, It'd be hard to rebuild our data center that way, but but that'd be a better way. Then we could reuse a lot more heat uh, and use a lot less water too. So great question. <laughs> yeah, and then we had more of a comment in the chat just that um, there's some folks that say they're currently cooling their supercomputer with a water inlet temp of 50 degrees C. Um, however, they've had to lower the temperature to 38 degrees C for the next supercomputer. So they're very interested in the initiative to increase the inlet temperatures um, to the extent that free cooling and dry cooling is possible all year round. So and, thanks for- You bet. I'm going to add to it just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, please do. I, I believe we as the HP, HPC community really need to push for that. Uh, there's there's a bit of a battle came up yesterday of uh, some manufacturers wanting lower case temperatures, colder and colder. Um, and really the, the solution is, is, is better heat transfer from to keep the, the, um, the chips cooler. And that initiative, look it up, is uh, ARPA-E cooler chips, is focused on just that. And they're spending um, tens of millions of dollars on this initiative to, to hopefully push the industry in this direction. So great comment. Totally agree. Great. Thanks so much, Otto. You bet. Um, is there someone asking a question? Okay, you're just some background noise. Great. Uh, well, we've got David Martinez up next to talk about um, thermosiphons. Right on. David, can, me, can you can you, can you guys play? hear me? Yep, we can hear right. you. Solid. Right on. Um, sorry, my camera crapped out, so you guys can't see me. So that's probably a good thing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks, Otto. Yeah, and thanks, Susie, for the good introductions and uh, uh, welcome everybody to this workshop. So I really enjoyed yesterday's session and today. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as as uh, we can present as good as we can. So um, uh, I'm going into thermal siphon. So yeah, uh, years ago I worked with uh, Steve Hammond many many years ago, and uh, NREL actually placed one of their computing systems onto our data center floor because they didn't have a, a large um, uh, HPC center. And when they built that, then they moved, uh, moved their system over there. And this, it's a partnership that's been enjoyed by both of us. We learn from each other and work very well with each other. And then we partnered to get the John, with Johnson Control to put the very first thermal siphon on a, on a data center at NREL. And we gathered that information. So uh, in the interim, we were building a new data center, uh, a 14,000 foot um, data center, just strictly for HPC. Um, and so the thought of using the thermal siphons was, was a thought at the time, but then uh, we made it in reality. So uh, here's a little bit on the, the data center itself and we'll go right into it. Um, so uh, in Albuquerque, we're about 5,200 50, 50, feet but we're a uh, uh, high desert, very pretty dry. So water is, um, is very um, scarce and at times here. So we need to be very uh, good stewards of the uh, water table here in our community. We're located in Kirtland Air Force Base uh, in the center of it. Uh, about 14,000 people work here at the labs, a really large um, complex. And we have uh, four data centers. Um, but we have a couple of legacy data centers and a couple of new data centers. And this one in particular is a lead gold data center. So here's some of the things that we uh, designed to uh, the entering water temperature 
for the liquid cooling is 72F. I'm going to talk an F and you guys can work on a conversion or I could go either way, but I did, uh, this is an F. So in the future, we're going to work our way up to 85. So that was the design. It's the data center is 85% liquid cooled design and 15% uh, air cooled. And the entering air temperature is 78. So we leverage the, our, our outdoor air probably about 75% uh, of the year. So we just get free cooling for the air side. And then we go to a, um, a cell deck, which is kind of like a big swamp cooler. And then if it's too humid, then we trim it with a medium temperature water. This uh, data center has three different loops. It has a chill water loop, which is entering right around uh, 59 to 60 F. Uh, and then we have a medium temperature loop that's between 60 and 70. And then we have uh, our higher temperature uh, loop, which is basically the water going into the chip, which is setting right now around 78F entering. Um, so that, that's a little bit on the uh, data center. Go ahead, please. Next. And so the reason we looked at thermal siphons, one, because they work very well in our climate. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons that I'll touch on those, but I want, I want to kind of go through water losses and how you calculate the water losses in your tower. So you have makeup water. So uh, you lose it through evaporation, drift and blow down. So when I, I, I have it broken down here so you can basically understand that and what it means. And so you, uh, you have cycles. So the cycles is basically how many times the water passes through your system, your chiller and your tower before you have to blow it down. Ours is like 3.5 cycles. And, uh, and the reason you do that is because of all the uh, solids and all the different things If you have in your water that's not pure on the open system, then basically you'll start uh, scaling up if you don't do this. So you need to uh, understand that, but you also need to understand uh, how much you do blow down. So uh, you can understand when you're planning systems, uh, how much water you're going to be using. And we do a thing called a NEPA statement. So we basically have to um, let our people know on the site exactly how much water we're going to be using uh, per kW, per ton, et cetera. And then there's drift. It's a droplets of water that's flowing off the tower. You know, the, this, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it, it's quite a bit. You know, it adds up. And the evaporation rate, you know, as the water goes over across an open cell tower, you start losing the evaporation. And so then you need the makeup water. And then, uh, of course, we talk about the blowdown. So I gave a quick example here. So basically, if we took 500 tons of cooling 24-7 and running at our 3.5 cycles, we use uh, approximately 7 million gallons of water a year. So that's, and that's just 500 tons. So, I mean, uh, our data center, our, the data center I'm talking about is, 14,000 square foot, it's going to have 14 megawatts in it. Right now we're at about nine megawatts. So you can see that that really adds up. Next slide, please. So then uh, people uh, talk about using dry coolers and thermal siphons. Well, you know, the dry coolers are really, uh, there's a lot of advantages to those. At least you're moving in the right direction and there's good useful uses for those. But here are just a few of the differences on the, from the thermal siphon. You know, the, so the thermal siphon is the dry, dry water side economizer. Uh, no freeze protection needed because it's basically the water passing through and just uh, the principles of the refrigeration cycle inside of it. Uh, 134A is what we use. Low pressure drop. Maintenance is really simple. It's basically just washing down the coil and just doing a health check on your fan systems. So you could do, do that through vibration analysis or things like that. And the controls on the thermal siphon dice. So you could basically like Otto talked about earlier, you can, you can dial in if you want to save water, or if you want to save energy, however you want to run your thermal siphons. Uh, we basically are trying to save water and energy. So we're kind of get a mix of both. So we've actually kind of tuned it up and kind of changed some of the controls that they came with. And we have our own uh, FM, BMS system, it's uh, Siemens Apogee. And all of our, uh, so we had the thermal sites and we tied them in and we actually took control of them. So we're actually doing a few different things. Uh, we have a team uh, made up of a bunch of mechanical engineers and experts. We meet every other week, it's called ongoing commissioning. And so basically we take a look at how we're operating our data center 
and what we want to do for the future. And uh, uh, so we, we play with the different temperatures and how we control things in our, our data center. So if you take another look, so if you, if you have, you know, mag bear, mag bearing chillers are probably one of the most efficient chillers on the market and they use cooling towers to reject the heat or, or whatever they do to reject the heat. But if you look at the efficiencies uh, and that's 0.1 kW per ton and, uh, you know, the most efficient mag bearings like 0 0.5, 0 0.7 and the 0 0.5 is really hard to get to. But if you start looking at that and the, I don't know what you pay for energy, you can kind of see uh, one of the other reasons to do this. The water use comparison is 6 million gallons to zero. The wet bulb is going to affect your chillers if you use a wet cell uh, uh, tower. So you're going to use more energy to try to dissipate that heat where the wet bulb doesn't affect the thermal siphon at all. So uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, next slide, please. And here's one of our thermal siphons on there. We now have four of them on, on, on top of our uh, our roof there we have, and they reject about 1.3 megawatts each when it's at uh, full capacity. Um, we use them about um, nine months out of the year. Uh, we actually, in uh, summer, we get up to temperatures somewhere around 95 to 100 F. Uh, this year has been a little warmer, but at night, since we're in a high desert, we cool, our temperatures drop by 15 to 20, sometimes 30 degrees depending on hot, how hot the heat it is that day. So we're able to uh, stage these uh, thermal siphons on like in the, around midnight to like three or four in the morning. So we're still getting some really good um, efficiencies out of those in the summertime. But as we raise our water temperature internally to like 85 F, then we are hoping to be 15 degree Delta to hopefully maybe a 20 degree Delta. So we we plan on running these thermal siphons almost 95% uh, of the year. And then we would trim it with a, uh, a hybrid fluid cooler uh, instead of going back to the chill water plant. So that's our plan. Um, and we're gonna be starting construction on that uh, as soon as it's in procurement right now. So that's be good. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here's uh, thermal siphon. This is kind of how it works. Uh, you can basically see you know, as the water enters and the refrigerant boils off and it goes up to the fans, to the coils, um, go, air, the fans pull the air across the coils and then it turns back to a liquid as it drops back down and starts a cycle all over. I think this is kind of interesting because you could see basically other than the fans, there's really no moving parts. And so you really uh, use some pump energy for the most of it. And the fans, of course, reject the heat However, uh, these are on VFDs, so like in the wintertime, uh, a strong wind, or uh, we do get the four seasons, cool outside air, really almost, the fans will run like a, uh, maybe 40 hertz or something like that, and uh, basically we'll get the same cooling effect, rejecting the heat, and uh, it's, it's a really, really great technology. I, uh, we're going to try to work with uh, John's controls again and probably build a bigger thermal siphon. I just don't know what, what that's gonna take and, and uh, uh, the results out of that. So more to come on that. Next slide, please. So you kind of look at, uh, so we have a, 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 a decent tool, it's called Enlight. So basically what we do, we take out, we extrapolate all our information from our Siemens Apogee which runs our plants and our, our whole lab. And we get a lot of information from there, but we also have our own information from the electrical side uh, of things in the data center. And basically that's how we calculate our PUE. Everything that we have in the data center is metered. So uh, basically we separate it all. Now it's not a perfect thing, PUE. I mean, that's what everybody goes by. You know, personally, I think TUE is a much better measurement. However, that's a little more difficult to do because we have so many different uh, types of computers on the floor. Uh, so then we'd have to take the energy out of the inside of the computer. And some of these systems don't have the ability to do that. So we use PUE. So you see our PUE is great when we run our thermal siphons, but it's not so great when we don't. I mean, we're up to the uh, 1.12 or something like that when we're not using them. So you can actually see the difference in the benefit from those. Next, please. 
And so here's our future. Uh, if you look, uh, you can see off to the right, we're going to be putting the uh, hybrid uh, fluid cooler there. And so basically the path would be into the computer. Um, and then what we're going to do is, uh, well, so basically we're going to go through our cooling doors um, and then we go into the computer and then back out and then out to the thermal siphons. And if in summertime, if we need to trim them, then we'll go to these big fluid coolers that we're going to be setting on the, on the path over here to trim it. So what that's going to allow us to do is to shut down. Um, yeah, with, what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to shut down uh, our um, mechanical cooling to this data center. And uh, I'm thinking... Uh, That'll be year round, and so um, that's our goal, and um, and that's and we're going to stick with it. So basically, everything that we buy now, we purchase. That's part of the um, uh, requirement that we put in is that they need to be able to take this X amount of water temperature entering to chip cool. And the reason that we use um, cooling doors on, on a lot of our systems um, because right now you can see the other two big fan systems that we're going to be putting in we didn't have that available at the time so what we did is we put the cooling doors to reject uh the air the components that aren't liquid cooled but we put them in a laminar flow arrangement so basically we put air into the front of the row and then uh, the water goes onto the chip and cools it but the extra ele uh, electronic components that aren't cooled with water hit the cooling door, cool it off, and that cool air passes that to the next, the front of the next row and the next row. So that way we save a lot of fan energy completely, and we can use a lot warmer temperatures on a cooling door of the water to do that because we're more, we're not uh, coupled to the to electronic parts, but we're a lot closer coupled. So we're able to save a lot more energy that way. Um, uh, next slide, please. And here's just, uh, a sample of uh, um, our cooling uh, efficiencies on the uh, thermal side. You kind of see as the day goes on, the months go on. Um, so basically, you know, where we are, our temperatures, uh, this is uh, in May, actually. So we get warm days and cool day and cool nights. And you can kind of see when it's nice and cool at night. And then as the days are warming up, the, they're less efficient, but uh, you're still getting quite a bit out of the systems. And this is just an example of one of the thermal siphons and we have four of them on our roof that we're utilizing right now. Next, please. And that's it. That's it for thermal siphons. So you guys got a, a good uh, 20 cent version and class of thermal siphons. <laughs> <laughs> Great, David, thanks so much. Um, right we on. had a couple couple of questions in the chat there was one question about um could you increase the inlet water temperature of your supercomputer to 100 degrees f that would enable you to cool your supercomputer all year round with free cooling yeah yeah so that the goal of the the design of the data center is 85 f and of course we'd love to increase it to 100 but uh we still have to to go with the manufacturer specs okay and then there was another question about what power per cabinet do you have in KW? Uh, so our range of cabinets are from 35 kilowatts to 320 kilowatts rack. Most of them are in the 70 to 80 kilowatts rack. And we have a few that are right around 300 and 340 kilowatts per rack. Thank you so much, David. And Tiziana, we'll have you up next. OK, thank you. Um, thank you, Susie, for the invitation. And welcome, everybody. So we can start with the second slide, please. Go ahead. OK, I want to just explain very quickly our system, our run. Uh, first, I have to say we are not cooling tower. We save water to pump less water in our center. We we'll explain after in next, the in next slide. So just to give you an overview of the system, our center is in the, on the on the right part, LCA, the name, and the, on the left part we have the the, the leak. Okay, the, the the pipeline length is 1.7 1.7 miles, 
Well, I difference 30 meters, that means 3.2 feet. I hope that I didn't do mistakes, which changed from, from one dimension to the one. What I say 20 meters is very important because on, before the, to put the water in the lake, we, we installed two micro turbine. They are able to, to, to produce 30% of the energy we need to pump the water to the center, okay? We can reach uh, 12,000 gallons per minute and uh, we take the water less uh, under 47 feet. And we have normally six degrees, that's mean uh, 42.8 Fahrenheit. And we return the water in the, sea. In the lake, we, we can return till uh, 42.8 Fahrenheit. We, today we have less, okay? And we put this water return on, on the deep from 40 feet because because the stratification of the lake, we don't want to avoid to put the water on, on minus 45 meters to avoid to to, mich, to have a Michelin between a, a hot water with with a, a cold water. So we have some other other data that could be interesting because one raised the question: you are not uh, um, worry about the lake because we will be increased the temperature. It's not the case because in Switzerland we have to, we are lucky because the lake is very deep. You can see, for example, like Lugano is more or less all all the all the lake in, in Switzerland is very deep. So. We can go to the next, please. Okay, what's happened? The temperature, now I'm speaking about glo global warming. So it's not just a story, <laughs> pity, but uh, we know what's happened. Uh, if you see in the left side, you see the, the graph that's been, that's been, uh, has been uh, prepared in 2011, 10 till nine to understand what's happened during the season. You can see at the season, you can see when, when the, the under the deep, the 30 meters, that is it's 40 feet more or less, the temperature don't change very much. You can go down 40, 50, 60 meters, um, doesn't change a lot. On the right side is a measure that we take from the start 2012 till 2023, till today, and we check what's happened really uh, our temperature on the lake, okay? We start with temperature more or less less six degree. We can say six degree, and today we have six dot seven degree. That's it's the difference between twelve year what's happened, and we saw that something changed in our lake, independently of the deep. So the global warming uh, is there. For us, it's not a problem because you will see after we uh, we show you some some picture about the temperature that run our system. We have a lot of reserve that I think I will be able to go to time and retire it <laughs> to reach this temperature that give you us a, a problem. And uh, I hope that as has been said in the first uh, first presentation that um, in the future, we are able to take the W4 water, actually standard water, to, to use higher, higher water. So that's, that's I think that's the goal. The, the problem is for, for us, for facility guys and girls, it's interesting, but have to be known from industry, industry go another. I at the moment they go another direction. I have to say so. They return a water water system like our Alp system, but they are not still ready to work with W4. W4. Okay, the next one, please. So I say I I have not a cooling tower. I couldn't say water in the sense of operation, but I can do what I can do in my system. I can pump less water. So we can save energy, I, I can pump less water. So when I start 2012, uh, we have a lot of water. Uh, it's uh, under uh, 25 liters per second. I said it too much. We don't need this water at this time because the power where, where installed was very low. And I asked to, to, the, to the pump uh, vendor, I asked the building automation guy, say, hey, guys, what's happened there? Ah, uh, you couldn't go down with the, with, the, with the variable frequency driver. You could do now 80%, so and so. I say, no, 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 it's not my story. So I, I am building automation specialist. Now I want to see where work the pump, okay? On the left side, you see the curve of the pump. What's happened? They, they put the minimal uh, rotation for the variable frequency drive 80% because it's quite normal. Pump the 250 kilowatt with big uh, uh, variable frequency drive, you couldn't go down till zero or 30%. But I say, no, no, I want to see the level minimal. The level was 70 and not 80. So we changed this one. We already saved some energy. What what's happened? You you work in not the best best curve of the pump. Okay, it's it's quite good, but it's not the best one. And so the evaluation was okay. What I can improve? Uh, what is my expectation in growing in power in the next five years? The expectation is growing some megawatt. I can put a, a smaller impeller to improve very much my situation and work in the right in the curve. The pump is 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 the better better performance. 
And we did that was what's the result? Well, I reached 95 liters per second and the power was 58 kilowatt per hour energy. So just not big investment, but really to, to uh, normal, I try to go very deep to understand why you put some parameter. It's typical they put in service some installation. No one check of that to say, okay, it's good guy. No one that don't know how, uh, pity for this guy, but because it's my specialization, say, no, no, I want to really see. Okay, I did the same work in our center because we are not chiller. We are happy because we're not chiller, but we have a lot of pump. So for example, I check the pump that was running normally uh, in twins pump, okay? They used to put the building automation, they reach the first pump till 75% and they come second one and they run together. That's mean two pump run, very low, performance point. They say, no, 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 you have to put the first one, the maximum, 95%, you run very well in the curve. And then when you need more water flow, you put the second one you can put together. And I, I, we check all the, each pump internally. We are able to, at the end with the, with the pump station, that I said before, to say 40, 50 kilowatt power. That's mean 45 kilowatt hour, the 45, 24 hours, seven day, 365 days per year. Okay, a lot of a lot of costs, I have to say. Okay, the next one, please. So when we start the project, we had to, we had to choose this, uh, the the suction uh, trainer div where we have to place uh, yep. our please. So, yep. uh, okay, okay. Uh, we already know that's uh, minus uh, 45 meter. Uh, there is not a natural light. The zebra mass couldn't couldn't grow. That's important. And, um, and the, the this dip could be reached from the diver to cleaning our suction trainer. We'd have a big problem with special gazes. That's it's important. And at the same time, we, we, did a, we did a school here in Ticino, did a simulation to understand, to avoid to such the mood from the, from, from the lake, what kind of velocity we can reach. That's what's important to us. That, based on that, we, the dimension of the pipeline has been dimensioned at the right, right uh, the diameter, okay? This is just at the start. Please go ahead. The next one. Okay. Despite what we, we try to understand what's happened and then, and then we, we, we have to work with the interact with the nature. And uh, we didn't know that can grow very quickly uh, this kind of bacteria, various bacteria. Okay. And we learn very quickly because one time we start ready pump at 100%, they will, they, 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 the dirt reach our X exchanger. What not a good experience. Okay. And what we did, we put new filters before the pump at the center. We change the flow path because we have the possibility to do that. That's a sedimentation process. It's very easy. We have to invest money. We already have our installation ready to do that. And uh, we regular cleaning the suction trainer each two months. So uh, at the start, a cooling system is one you have not the, the know-how, I have to say. You have some know-how, but you have to learn, okay? And you learn each year something new. And this was a good lesson, I have to say. That is under control. We say we are happy about the, the first challenges that we discover. Okay, next one, please. Okay, as I said, we have a pumping station on the on the on the right and the, and the, on the left our silt the, our building. Um, I just take in mind this mash mash dimension zero dot one. I will say why you have to take in mind. We put new filter before the pump, and we improve very very much the 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 situation. Okay, the next one, please. So now what we use, this is our center, our basement. You can see in green, in two, two kinds of green. We are already two, two, two loops. One loop is the loop that comes, the, we will see after the temperature. It's the low temperature loop. And after we have the middle temperature loop, what's, what's happened? The water comes in the first X exchanger. We have three times 4.7 megawatt X exchanger. The water go in the, the main system, like Pittstein, the Alps. The water return, and the same water we reuse for the small system. That means we pump, we pump one time and we use the water twice. And what could be happen in the future, because we are start a study, we can use reuse the same water through time. That will be, for sure, improvement, not just from, from, the, from the performance point of view, but we can, in the future, um, uh, connect more supercomputers and then more power. So, but what kind of temperature will be expected in the third loop? That means I start with I start with with uh, with a study, but if it makes no sense to start a study because the third loop, the future loop, this high temperature loop will be too much high, make no sense. That means the, the question is 
is today the, the technical the 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 IT uh, vendor ready to to fit with the uh, the third loop temperature or not? So I can say yes because we are quite happy. You see, twenty one degrees Celsius. Uh, I for sorry, it's a uh, I think it's sixty nine point eight Fahrenheit. Yes, that is quite a good temperature. That means okay, Tiziano, you can carry on your study. Without this answer, you say, no, stay there. You have to wait till the, the computer vendor is able to, to reach W4, OK? What could be happen? That's, I, we can, today, we, we can connect 21 megawatt, OK? That means the low temperature loop is 14, 7 for the middle, and 7 the future for the high temperature loop. I21, that means 69, is not high. <laughs> it's, it's a good temperature. But, I put the question for my colleagues there, what kind of uh, the, the power you have for cabinet? Because to, if you have to cool 50, 60 kilowatt, it's it's quite, I don't have not to say sorry, easy. But if you have cabinet like it, and the new one has 345 kilowatt, concentrate in a very small uh, um, place, there you need really low temperatures. So the vendor today are not able to run with higher temperature like under finite. That, that's that is what I saw. That is what I saw. Uh, for 21 degrees, nothing but uh, 37. That is more or less under uh, under 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 finite. Today they are not ready. They say perhaps can run, but the problem to me it's the following: we we bought new computer, okay, but we didn't have the microprocessor. Grace Hopper, okay. No one, no brace Hopper, okay. You you want to buy Grace Hopper, okay. It's a good good. Good thing, but the problem is if you are not thermal data and you put the gray sopper with 30 a bit under Fahrenheit, in German say of Wiedersehen, no way. So that, that means really I am happy because I have this kind of temperature. If my director bought buy another computer with this power, I am quite sure we'll be able to cool. That's it, the difference, just to say. Okay, please the next one. So this is next step that I want to carry on because like uh, FM guys, I am not very happy <laughs> because, uh, you know, sorry, I have to say the IT guys use kilowatt like uh, Apple. They use temperature like peanuts uh, and you install like a uh, low temperature because it's nice to have. Okay. And I understood very, very a lesson, lesson that I learned one, one more than one year ago. I say, okay, Tiziano, you see the, the green, the green, please, the green, the, um, section on the left. This is what I know today. It's my temperature. It's what I put in the machine. What I don't know is the CDU cooling system in the machine and the compute node temperature and so I say, OK, I don't want to be blind in the future because I want to know all because I don't trust that they need so very low temperature. I have to be able to, to check the temperature of my system, the CDU, and the, 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 the node to be able to understand really what's happened, OK? And that is a, a word that has been carried on the last year. And I'm very happy because thanks to my uh, colleagues, we are really put under the control the first first uh, row from Alps, the new system. So I can really check. I, I don't take a lot of data from computer X. I take temperature and power, OK? Now in five seconds, I will, I will take for one second. Why is so important? Because Till two years ago, three years ago, we bought some, some microprocessors that were quite known. Second, so our computer had COVID like in Oak Ridge because my friend Rogers say, my. Sorry, my, my, my computer have a COVID. We have the same problem internally to the computer uh, node. We had bacteria. I can't say because they're well, well known. They put glycol, I say, okay, guys, you put glycol, but now I want to know what's happened. Okay, what I, I did, I start a HPL, I say, I want to start an HPL to understand what is what is the situation. And I, I saw the worst case scenario is, I put five degrees, it's four degree differences. I lost four degrees, I say, okay, guys, for the first row isn't a problem because because it's a row existent, it's not a gray sopper, but now it's coming gray sopper. You didn't start the architecture from the blade, okay? But now you have to start to plan to be able to run new, new architecture with the temperature that already there because I installed 5 million with Frank cooling system. I don't want to change that. You 
have to be run your system with glycol. I don't care that. This is a data that we give and, and, and someone said, you know, Tiziano, we don't want to, to lose the possibility. No, we don't lose that, but they have to know really that I couldn't throw away 5 million of this frank cooling system because they, they don't use to work in the better way, sorry. So for that, they start to, to, to take the very, very, very precise the data there. As I said, I don't want to know all the data. I need the data that I need. It, we, I am able today to put in the same line, the same time, the data from calling from CDU at the compute node. That's important for, from the strategic point of view, from the analysis that we carry on after is very important. Last but not least, I have to say, um, great software seemed to be, I have some experience because I start 2010 here. I didn't see a system that reach nominal power. So I am not quite sure that some, we carry on some tests. It seemed to be that in some cases, this kind of microprocessor carries 90% of nominal. It, it's not like this all way, the 80%, 82% in HPL and 40% in normal running. So, and for that, I want to know really my data. I want to know, I have to, my data under control because I want to work very well with the guys that's installed the, the, the IT system and, and speak with this guy to understand, okay, you have to know that if you put another Another exigent in your cooling system, I couldn't carry on your this kind of temperature. So I didn't put another slide more, but just from the waste heat point of view, we already use the waste the, 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 on the same pipeline. There is a new a new university in Ticino that use our waste heat, and now the electricity company that sells us the electricity is building a new power plant that will use six megawatt of our waste heat. And if you think about the head pump, water, water pump with a COP of five, five, six, seven, that's mean six megawatt, you can multiply six times. And I am very happy that they, in the future, the future is next year, they will be able to use our waste it in the better way. So I think we are reached the last, uh, last slide. Ah, no, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Tiziana, we're, I... we're a couple of minutes over. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to yeah. cut you off. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. That's great information and yep. really appreciate it. Um, we had just one quick question about um, if you saved 450 kilowatts, what's the overall power consumption of the pumps? It sounds like that's a lot of power. Is it worth even moving all that water? Yeah, then we have to, for example, pump station, we have three pumps, 250 kilowatts. Now we are running just one. We have, because we increase the water flow, now we have under kilowatts. So. And, and the internal to the center is just pump. We have pump for secondary loop, for primary loop, it's just pump, no chiller. And you, you put all the all the power together, it's a lot of lot of power for sure. Great. Well, thank you so much to Ziano. Um, thank you to Otto and David. Great presentation. Sorry we um, had to cut you off at the end here, Tiziano, but we'll, I think we'll be sharing the slides no out problem. and folks can um, look in more depth and hopefully we'll have some discussions and be able to to make some connections here if folks have further questions for our speakers but huge thank you to all of you um, for going in depth on on water today Sid, I think you're muted. Gosh, yes, I am. <laughs> thanks, Adley. Uh, firstly, thanks again, Suzy, uh, for driving the previous session. Uh, next session up is HPC Modular Data Centers. Um, a quick introduction to the moderator, Chris Tanner, uh, Facilities Manager for the NAS division, oversees modifications to support the supercomputers and subsystems at uh, NASA Advanced Supercomputing Facility. In this role, he manages the design, development, construction, and operation of leading technology facilities that provide cost-effective operations of HPC systems. And with that, over to you, Chris. Chris Tanner. 
Uh, we can't hear you. About now, can you hear me now? Y yes, we can. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, and can you see me yet? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Oh, excellent. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working through the, uh, NASA doesn't let us use Zoom natively, so I'm working through the web browser and I'm finding that it's more difficult than I thought it was. So we have, uh, joining me today, so this is actually my slides, but what joining me today is uh, Professor uh, Volker uh, Lindenstruth, uh, from, who's going to talk about the uh, GSI uh, Green Cube, and uh, Thomas uh, Eicherman from the uh, ULIP uh, Supercomputing Center, who's talking about uh, some of their modular uh, data center going forward. So we're going we're gonna to move a little bit from water to the world of, of modular data centers and and why they may be uh, a good uh, good direction for some uh, for some of us um, since we're kind of behind schedule I guess I'll go ahead and and say uh, oops not yet the do you have the slide deck from Volker yes I do okay. he's, he's gonna go first I think Okay, sorry so about we'll that. Have Volker first, and then Thomas, and then I'll finish it up at the end. Okay. And if we run Not over, sure. Volker, do you want to do your own, or do you want Torsten to do it? I can do either way. <clears throat> I uh, wouldn't be a problem if I just share directly. Yes, yeah, that would make it easier, I think. Okay, one second. So here we are, but I have to go to the beginning. So I'm going to talk about a data center, which we call Green Cube, um, which has a bit of a different optimization, um, as you will see, but it is highly efficient. Um, to start with, um, I just want to um, outline once more, um, cooling means moving heat, and for that you need a medium. Um, there are two available. One is air, one is water. The thermal capacity difference between is a factor of 4,000, and this is why, obviously, we also focus at using air. Um, these are a couple of number games which are in the, in the handouts uh, if you want to look at them. Um, in order to um, transfer heat as quickly as possible, we decided to go for real heat exchangers. Um, many reasons behind that. Uh, we are trying to also uh, be able to buy computers from the mass market, and today most of them are still air cooled. On the other hand, we have water directly at, at the rack, and we can also accommodate systems which directly cool with water. One of the aspects which have been discussed in case of reader heat exchangers was the back pressure, and you see um at uh, reasonable operating conditions we are below 20 pascal and that means this is absolutely no issue um the pressure drop in the water cycle of the um read or heat exchanger is so low that one could even use them with a vacuum system to totally avoid any risk of leaks but we have not done that in the green cube simply for cost reasons uh, these racks are available today even with a cooling power of 75 kilowatt per rack however we have installed 35 kilowatts per rack because for the applications we have, that is sufficient. Um, so that enables us to have a very, very simple setup. Uh, you see basically the racks with the rear door heat exchangers on the left, cold water is coming in, warm water is returned. Um, there is one additional heat exchanger and we are using open loop evaporative coolers and they do need quite a bit of water. On the other hand, at the site where we are at, Water consumption is not uh, an issue, uh, both availability and um, cost. The by far most dominant cost is the electricity itself. The water cost is at the level of uh, something like 2% of the energy cost. Um, so that basically reduces the data center to two pump stations, one 
uh, for the secondary loop uh, going to the server room and the other for the primary loop going to the um, um, back coolers. And the heat exchanger here is simply to separate the two because the water in the primary loop obviously can be dirty. And that uh, means from time to time, uh, something like once every two years, the heat exchangers have to be cleaned. Everything is N plus one redundant here. So no failure causes downtime. What I have not shown here is we have two additional heat exchangers. One is uh, taking uh, the heat from the servers, this cycle here, and couples it to a neighboring uh, administrative building for heating. And the second heat exchanger basically takes the uh, cold water coming from the evaporative coolers and also uh, uh, sends it uh, to the um, neighboring administrative building in summer. So basically in summer, we can use the back coolers to have a very efficient way to cool uh, the uh, uh, building next door, or in winter, we use the heat to heat the building. However, all further numbers are about efficiency do not include this uh, additional uh, side effect here. Um, I have also to say that comparing with the uh, amount of power the computers generate, the building is way too small to take a significant fraction. But that was also to demonstrate that this actually works. This technology is patented and tech transferred and commercially available. Now here is a, a sketch of the building itself. Um, here you see the ground floor. We have eight rows with 16, 19 inch racks. Um, in between two rows, we always have the pipes supporting the cooling water for the racks. Um, you see that we have um, basically two transformers. Also here, it's fully redundant. Um, since we can supply the racks from the top and the bottom, we basically have one set of pipes to support two floors, which makes the green cube, as you see here, which has six floors, basically three independent data centers stacked on top of each other. Um, that means also that the transformers go up in height, uh, which keeps the uh, copper, the low voltage copper distribution um, short, that is a matter of cost. You see then we have here two uh, low voltage distribution rooms for full redundancy and in the ground floor we have two um, mid voltage 20 kilovolt distribution rooms which support then all the transformers. Um, and here you basically see how the system is being built vertically. Um, the um, Next slide, you see a, a picture of how it looks inside. Uh, and now you know why it's called Green Cube, right? I mean, um, has been quite a, a discussion with the architects to finally agree on which kind of green we are going to use. Here you see the three pipes. Um, it is three pipes because we're using a Tichelmann pumping scheme. And that means without any additional flow, flow regulation, we have the same flow rate going through all racks, and that is by far the cheapest and simplest way to do it. Um, rather short, flexible cables supporting the racks. Here you see the floor where the, uh, the, the support pipes are mounted at the ceiling. The next floor would simply uh, have the uh, pipes coming in from below, and you wouldn't have this infrastructure here. Electricity distribution is basically directly over the racks. Um, the power is completely fully 2N. We have a special installation here, um, which uses the advantage that the site has two independent power plants. Um, um, so we have two independent 400 kilovolt supply lines being fed from independent power plants. And that means we basically go from there completely redundant and independent all the way to the two PDUs in one rack and supply the redundant power supplies in the computer. And that allows us to have full redundancy without having uh, diesel generators and all the associated infrastructure, which is quite expensive. Um, this is how it looks from the outside. Um, the uh, These two green uh, um, stripes, which are illuminated at night, uh, uh, indicate the three data centers uh, stacked on top of each other. Um, the uh, outside is a, a sheet metal kind of um, cover and it is per completely grounded, so uh, it forms a Faraday cage. Um, it can be built very quickly. This is the uh, construction schedule. 
we, we started December 1st and uh, sign off of the data center was October 10. Electro and uh, pumping was a few weeks later. So basically uh, within 10 months, the data center was built and completed. And uh, we did a performance test, as you can see here, the, the problem uh, was I could not get more than 2.5 megawatts of heat dummies. And since we also wanted to torture the data center by over, uh, running overheat cycles and stuff like that, we didn't want to use computers. But uh, as you can see here, um, at this particular time, we reached 2.5 um, uh, megawatts of power consumption. And if you look at the cooling power consumption at the same point in time, we are below 1.03 uh, PoE of that system, which means it's highly efficient. Uh, we were running for a long time at a very low utilization that is simply caused by the fact that the facility is not quite yet ready. Uh, GSI is building a very large scale accelerator infrastructure and it is still in construction and consequently, therefore, they didn't need uh, the computers yet. But even at this very low utilization, the systems usually run highly inefficient. Our annual average PoE, not including the use of the late uh, heat for uh, heating, is 1.07. Um, we have won lots of prizes. Um, I'm particularly proud about the German so-called uh, so Blauer Engel, which is um, awarded by the Federal Minis uh, Ministry of, for Environment. Um, and it requires uh, rather tough scrutiny. So all the numbers we produce are being verified by an independent organization to make sure everything is perfectly correct. And so this uh, uh, having this sign means that everything is in perfect shape here. Um, we have a few other uh, uh, sites which are using this and uh, there are quite a few uh, others I cannot talk about because it's commercial and they did not uh, want to be listed but you see there are a few um, uh, places where this technology is being used and it is working very well. Um, this is a photo of the Airbus Defense and Space and you see the similarities uh, with our system, although they did not uh, have uh, the uh, six stories, they only have two. Coming to the conclusion, um, basically we operate the data center at a rather low um, OPEX. Uh, building costs uh, were at 2016, 1.5 euros per watt, which is uh, very, very inexpensive. Um, we have a very small footprint. We reach more than 30 kilowatts per square meter uh, in the white space. Um, there is no assumption about the particular computer hardware being used. And I should say that in this uh, data center, we have one computer which is today listed at position 10 of the green 500 list. And um, that means that the power for the fans, which is also all, uh, an issue of debate, which is included in the power of the computer is not such a dramatic issue. Um, we um, have redundant energy supply. Um, the indirect free cooling is most cost effective. However, it does need quite a bit of water, as you know. Um, <clears throat> the um, um, Use of heat and also cooling for uh, buildings makes sense and is being used. It works best if the building has floor slash wall heating, which is the case here. Um, so if you simply calculate the potential savings, they are very significant. Um, and um, I have to say that the system is working without any kind of issues, interruptions now since seven years, and the operating cost is very little. Uh, it is being done by, uh, by industry, so we have outsourced everything, and uh, the total cost to operate with a 24-7 surveillance uh, is about 100,000 euros per year. So that is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, do we have any, any, should we, I, I was thinking we could do questions at the very end. Uh, I don't see anything in the chat so far. 
So why don't uh, we move to uh, Thomas's uh, presentation? Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Uh, should I share your slides or do you want to present? Oh, yourself? I can I can do that myself. I think it's okay. most convenient. So, yes, you can. Yeah, you can see now my presentation full screen, I guess. Yes, we can. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, today, uh, I was asked to, to give a little presentation on, on our plans for building up a new modular data center for Jupiter, which is uh, will be the first European exascale system. Uh, unfortunately, we are still in a phase uh, where procurements are not fully completed, so I cannot provide too much detail, uh, but probably stick to giving you rough ideas. So um, to give you a glimpse of uh, where we are, uh, so we are located in the research center Jürich, which is in, in the west of Germany, close to Cologne and Aachen. Um, we are, a, for German standards, fairly large center with a staff of about 7,000 people. Um, it's a multidisciplinary center where the main activities are centered around information, energy, and bioeconomy. And within the center, you can see this uh, little yellow, you know, uh, circle is the Jülich Supercomputing Center. Uh, we have about, we are about 300 persons. Uh, we are active in um, uh, providing various systems to communities, supercomputers, but also quantum system and uh, recent, more recently also uh, systems for AI. Uh, we're doing, of course, application support, doing R&D in methods, tools, and architectures, and also uh, train uh, users and, and other people. Um, we follow for our systems a modular approach. Our current top rank system is called Jewels, uh, which uh, started in uh, as number seven in the top 500 list in November 2020. So the next step <clears throat> will be Jupiter. Uh, as I initially said, the first European Exascale system. It will be owned by the EuroHPC, which is a joint undertaking between the European Commission, member states, and some private partners. Uh, the main mission of EuroHPC is they took over the funding of all uh, HPC related projects from the European Commission. Uh, and they are uh, co funding petascale uh, systems and own a few pre exascale, three of them, and in the future exascale systems. For, for Europe. Um, Jupiter, the JU, so Joint Undertaking Pioneer for Innovative and Transformative Exascale Research, uh, will be the first of these exascale systems. Uh, Jülich was selected as the hosting site um, uh, mid last year. Um, the installation of the system will start uh, early next year, and we're targeting startup operation in Q4. Total cost of the system will be uh, 500 million euros, so TCO, including operation costs. And they will easily be shared between EuroHPC and uh, Germany, uh, both from the federal government and also the local state of Northern Westphalia. So what will the system look like? It will be a modular system. So the main flops will come from a GPU-based booster, which should have uh, will have one exaflop uh, limpack performance it will be accompanied by a cluster module where we do not really target high uh, flops but a good byte per flop ratio um, and this uh, storage system will be layered one tiered one with uh, flash disk and, and tape with a total capacity of a bit more than than an exabyte so overall, we target, compared to our current top system, an application performance gain of a factor of 20 for this new system. And the modular approach will also allow to add, uh, few in the future, uh, additional modules like quantum systems or future, possibly, EU technology modules. Um, <clears throat> so what are we doing concerning the uh, sustainability of, of that system? So. 
Uh, first of all, we, what we feel is that uh, choosing the right components and architecture is important. So with this modular architecture, we um, target uh, a good utilization and um, uh, offer users the possibility to choose the right architecture for their jobs. So we uh, avoid wasting energy for underutilized or uh, not well performing codes. We will, of course, operate the system with uh, procuring green energy, uh, electricity. We will have direct warm water cooling, and we will uh, also uh, reuse a substantial <clears throat> uh, fraction of, of the waste heat. Initially, we target uh, to install a heat pump, which will um, leverage a three and a half megawatt of heat from the system. Uh, and we also do a little bit of refurbishing on our campus to enable broader usage of, of the waste heat. Um, another thing we did is we, uh, to, to save a little bit of optimization of the energy supply, so we saved one uh, layer of transformers by, um, well, 110 kilovolts are uh, provided to the campus and they are transformed back to 335 kilowatts, kilovolts, sorry, uh, which is the handover to, to the campus network. And we provide this uh, directly to the system where it will be transformed to the 400 watts that uh, the components are using. What you see on the picture is the location of the data center. So you see, uh, although the picture is a few months old, it's, the site looks very much uh, the same still. Um, so requirements of the system is what we estimated when we started the project, but it's still mostly uh, the case for, for the actual system. So we uh, plan for a white space of, of 1,200 square meters, uh, IT power of up to 27 megawatts, um, a diesel, uh, so UPS and, and uh, diesel uh, for supporting at least the storage and network components of one and a half megawatt. Most of the heat will be dissipated by uh, direct warm water cooling, but for some components, we still need uh, cold water for, for air cooling. So initially, we actually planned to build a conventional data center for that, but it turned out that both in terms of costs and timing, this was actually not feasible, so we had to uh, rethink our plans and finally came up with uh, the plan to build now a modular data center. Uh, the idea here is that we consider this modules or containers as, uh, as the next level of system integration. So you start putting uh, compute nodes in racks and then you put racks in containers, so containers is in this idea the, the new level of, of handling systems and um, let's say the, the base basic unit. So the um, advantages that we see uh, for this uh, approach of, of container-based center is first of all time to set things up. So um, the vendors can use prefabricated modules, um, which will reduce the time for planning and installation. Uh, of, of the center. Um, we expect smoother installation of the system. So um, the vendors, the, the computer vendors can uh, pre-install and test, pre-install the, the racks in, in, the, in their containers in their factory and do some uh, testing. So the setup uh, on, on the hosting site in Jülich should be much smoother than, than usually. Um, redundancy is an aspect, so um, modules can, depending how you finally design the centers, can potentially at least act as independent units, for example, as independent uh, zones of, of fire protection and, and other aspects of, of redundancy. Um, concerning costs, uh, we also expect quite substantial savings since we can now really tailor the data center to the needs of the system. We don't have to over-provision in terms of size or cooling or, or electricity. 
And uh, we also had a lot of flexibility. So if needed, we can uh, change exchange containers fairly easily if they are not fit for, let's say, requirements of a future system. Uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, we expect that we can reach uh, comparable levels of, of PUE uh, compared to concrete data centers. So also here we target to it below uh, 1.1, of course. Um, and uh, also being able to replace containers uh, will make <clears throat> uh, make it more easy to, to leverage new technology. So don't expect to have a, a data center which is then outdated after 10 or 15 years. Uh, but then would typically just uh, replace containers if needed. So the status uh, of this is that now the construction of this um, generic concrete flat slab of uh, 85 times 42 meters is underway. So that will be the foundation where the, the container centers will be placed upon. A little bit of outlook. So uh, I mentioned uh, waste heat usage. Um, so we have a project on, on the, in the research center, which is called Living Lab Energy Campus, which uh, deals with um, developing and deploying an integrated energy management for the campus, uh, producing and storing renewable energy and monitoring, predicting usage. So be able to steer the whole energy supply system, uh, which also includes a gas fired um, plant, which is producing both cooling, heating, and power, electrical power, um, and, and uh, is used for as I, supplying the, the, uh, the demands of the center of these three uh, media. So what is, uh, well, will be <clears throat> uh, coming up in the next uh, few months, which is building <clears throat> construction is all, almost completed, is a low temperature uh, uh, water ring where we use the waste heat from our current systems, which are located here in this uh, building to heat the, uh, the offices um, and labs uh, in the vicinity of, of our center. Uh, for the modern buildings, the heat that we provide of 40 degrees Celsius is sufficient. We also have a couple of older buildings which then have decentralized uh, heat pumps. Uh, to reach the required levels for, for heating the, the buildings in the winter time, including our dentist center, by the way. Um, a more mid to long-term outlook is that uh, with the uh, power that the energy or the heat that Jupiter will provide, we expect on the average to be in the order of 15 megawatts or slightly below, which is almost double uh, of the demand that the uh, heat demand that the campus has, not all for heating buildings, of course, but also process heat for experiments and things like that. Um, so Jupiter can quite substantially uh, contribute to that. Um, and so on the midterm, the idea is that partially part of the required heat will be provided by, by the waste heat of Jupiter and on the long term, uh, potentially all of that, which will then allow to put our gas-fired uh, cooling, heating, and power plant in a different mode of operation where it will just produce um, energy and, and cooling. And that will, uh, on the long run, has the potential to decrease our <clears throat> uh, CO2 footprint for, for the campus substantially. And if we still have uh, waste heat left, uh, there is also interest in the city of Jülich to use it, but this is really a very long-term perspective since we would have to provide uh, or build um, several kilometers long uh, pipeline for, for transporting the heat and that is not uh, on our short-term roadmap, I should say. So to sum up, um, to make our center more sustainable, we are looking at various levels. So we start by having energy efficient systems and uh, system architectures. Uh, we use free cooling, of course. Um, we try to reuse the waste heat, uh, and that is all coming. We bring that to the next level on uh, for for our Jupiter system. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you very much. 
That was excellent. Um, so I cannot prevent or uh, prevent my slides. So, Torsten, do you have the ability to? There we go. Thank you. Okay, is that still visible? Yeah. Yep, that's excellent. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So I'm Chris Tanner. I'm the facility manager at uh, the NASA Advanced Supercomputing uh, Division uh, at the uh, Ames Research Center. So we do modular data centers, and we've been doing them for roughly about uh, seven years. Uh, so um, where uh, where Thomas is just about to have a concrete pad. Um, I have a concrete pad that's a couple years older than him and uh, with one module sitting on top of it. So uh, next slide, please. So we actually have uh, three data centers at, uh, at Ames. We have uh, the traditional data center that uh, I think we're all familiar with. Uh, it's the home of our Pallades and Cavius uh, computers as well as it's got our data storage, and it really is an office building. There's, uh, there's about seating for 200 staff. Of course, with uh, work from home times, uh, I would say uh, at most we probably have 40, 50 people in the building. Uh, but, uh, but it was in 1986 when it was built, um, it, there was a, a kind of a design to put the researchers next to the um, next to the computers. Networking uh, technology wasn't as prevalent or sophisticated as now. Uh, so uh, that's why we, we basically have a computer center in a, uh, in a uh, office building. Uh, we have, uh, in this building, there's four megawatts of, of power with uh, a megawatt worth of cooling uh, that powers, you know, chillers to a uh, chilled water system to rear door heat exchangers and we do have a UPS that can carry the entire load but uh, it's it's pretty much the you know the data center that we're all familiar with uh, we also have our prototype which is a two module facility uh, directly across the street and um, it use one module is uh, just filtered outside air with a little bit of evapor evaporative cooling to uh, to cool off the airstream through the racks, uh, and the other is water cooled. And then we have a third facility that is down the street from our main facility, uh, and it is uh, our home to our Aiken computer, which uh, is about 2.1 megawatts and is all water cooled. So, next slide. So we, uh, we offer NASA, we, NASA users or um, compute resources to all of NASA. Uh, all the mission directorates have the ability to use the computer. We have five separate computers as well as a visualization wall, uh, about 100 petabytes of uh, disk storage and about 1,500 petabytes of disk drives. And, and the staff to uh, to care for all these things. We have, a, we have a systems group that is basically the system administrators that are taking care of the computer. We have a cloud group that's working to kind of do a integrate hybrid of, of some cloud resources with our on-prem resources. We have an apps group that uh, will uh, help users with codes, a viz group that takes the data and visualizes it and makes it easier for researchers to understand what they have. And then uh, all the other groups that will work towards kind of making life easier for, for users. So we're, the, we're a full service uh, computer center and not just, not just the, say a co-location facility. So next slide. So, as I said before, we have we have our traditional data center uh, that we've been using for almost 40 years. 
Uh, but when it came time, you know, we to to get more resources, we looked at all different kinds and and moved to modular. And and the reason we moved to modular was, you know, we were kind of at we were out of space, uh, floor space wise, power space, cooling space. Uh, we just um, couldn't get any larger, and there is a demand uh, from NASA users that we don't have enough resources for them to use. Oftentimes, there's quite a, uh, a waiting list or a lead time to, uh, to run your jobs. Uh, and we found that, uh, you know, in the old days, when we had capacity, uh, it was very easy to, uh, to just uh, look at just the cost of what it ran, would cost to, to run. So if we had a group of nodes where, where we looked at the cost of maintaining them Maya, for three years would be exceeding the cost of just buying new ones that could do the same amount of work, we would go ahead and replace them. But about maybe, say, 10 years ago, we found out that uh, when we wanted to buy new nodes, we didn't have any opportunity to, or to install them without getting rid of existing nodes or decommissioning existing nodes and those nodes actually still had a fair amount of life yes in them and and so uh we weren't really getting all the uptick in uh capability that we were paying for because we were decommissioning things sooner than we had expected so we took a took a look at what to do next and we uh, actually even contracted a third-party survey who offered perhaps a, a best approach for expanding the facility might be a modular data center. And, and the, the ability you know, the, that we get with modular is, is kind of the, the build it when you need it approach. So not only, um, not only would it provide our, our co quick capacity uptick, but it would also limit the amount of capital expenditures because we're only putting together what we need. And then once the modules get full, you can go ahead and put another one next to it. Uh, kind of, I uh, use the phrase, a uh, Lego approach. Uh, we can just snap another one down on the pad and, and continue on uh, expanding capacity that way. And of course, there is some operating expense uh, benefits in that we're only cooling the amount of area that uh, needs to be cooled. In other words, we're not building a, a large room that is cooling empty white space. We're, we're just uh, cooling the IT uh, resources that, that needed at the time. So next. So while... Uh, while we did feel that modular was the best way, uh, when we went to NASA management asking for a large space and a large amount of money to build a new facility, uh, the answer was, could you do it on a smaller scale first and prove it works? And, and so that's exactly what we did. So the, on the left-hand picture here is, is a site that we built across the street just on, a, on the corner. Uh, it, uh, we poured a uh, mat slab foundation, so it's 18 inches of, uh, of concrete, and then ran utility services, uh, water, new conductors. We sited a transformer right there on the, uh, on the pad and uh, stuck the first module there uh, on it. Uh, it uh, it's an air-cooled module, 100% air-cooled. So and we, we use the outside air, which we filter, uh, and occasionally we'll run through an evaporative cooler to drop the temperature of the incoming airstream. But that, truthfully, that's pretty rare. It, uh, I, I don't have a feel for how many hours exactly we might uh, run uh, evaporative cooling on this, but I, I want to say it, it feels like it's in the, just a couple hundred. Uh, there is no mechanical refrigeration in it whatsoever. And so the, the unit is capable of 20 racks. We have a typical IT load of about 350 kilowatts on a, on a normal day. 
and it is uh, it's only cooled by eight kilowatts of fan. So, uh, unfortunately, I'm on PDF instead of uh, PowerPoint, so I can't show you the animation uh, of this little module here that in the right hand photo. So it's just a still, but uh, air goes in the uh, goes in the end and it gets drawn across with fans into a cold dial and uh, on the other end, there's another intake and, and cold dial. And so the two cold dials then uh, meet in a common hot aisle where that little kind of top part is and hot air exhaust out there. So air just goes once through. So this, this, this module was wildly successful. It, uh, it's been in operation for uh, seven years and um, it, it needs almost no effort whatsoever on my part. The control systems work very well. So next. So uh, then um, when it came time to get a second module, uh, I would say the, uh, uh, we're, kind of, uh, we're kind of a slave to the computer industry. And as it got denser and denser, uh, we went from the, let's say, 30 kilowatts a rack that we had in our first module to now 65 kilowatts a rack water cooled uh, and and so we had to change the technology of the module that we were using uh, i'm sure you know most of us are are aware of the, the you know, direct liquid on chip uh, we put module two you can see directly adjacent to module one and and in fact you can go from one module to the others there's uh, the center walls were uh, uh, doors were added so the benefit of module two is it's double the amount of nodes. So it's doing more work. Uh, it's also three times the power consumption. So what you're looking at here is hybrid or evaporative coolers that are sitting on top of the roof. Uh, and um, their cooling water uh, provides, uh, it actually uh, provides cooling water to CDUs. And then of course the CDUs provide cooling water directly to the processors. Uh, we make uh, 80 Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius uh, water uh, from the evaporative coolers on the roof. So next. Uh, my, again, my animation isn't going to work, but you know, as a, you know, the uh, hot water goes from the CDUs uh, up, to, uh, up to the hybrid coolers. They, as it goes through the uh, the coils, fans on top, pull air across. Uh, because we're making 80 degree water or running on 80 degree water to uh, to our CDUs, uh, we are probably running we're probably running evaporative water almost every day. Well, certainly every day during the summer, uh, and I'll say. <clears throat> Probably roughly three, four thousand hours a year, is is what uh, what we're running water on, uh, and then um, you know, of course, my animation doesn't work, but then it shows blue lines coming back and going to the chips. So we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, after 2017, which is when uh, the uh, water cooled prototype was completed. Uh, we were extremely happy with how well modular data centers were working for us. And, and at that point, we committed to modular data centers will be how we expand our um, facility going forward. So we have um, built a one acre site, uh, roughly a quarter mile, you know, Five six hundred meters, I guess, uh, from our main facility. Uh, this facility is is all poured concrete, uh, an acre, a little over an acre in site, so we can hold twelve modules on it. Plus, uh, we're looking a good two three data modules on it. So we're we're expecting that at full build out, we could have as many as fifteen modules on it. We have uh, the site supported with a. Uh, 30 megawatt transformer. Uh, it comes straight from our substation that uh, is, is part of Ames. 
and we uh, we ran conductors uh, under the street uh, from the substation to the to the site. We uh, we have an incoming of 115 kV, and we brought 25 kV to uh, to our site. Uh, and then uh, right now the modules are running at uh, 480 volts. Uh, each module will have its own step down transformer. Uh, you can see in, in the picture here, not only does it have its own step down transformer, uh, the coolers are attached, you know, pumps attached are specifically for a module. Uh, oops, I got a pack check, I'm sorry. Uh, and um, so as we go forward, each module will have its own infrastructure. Uh, like there'll be no common uh, uh, cooling plant to uh, provide uh, cooling water to the modules. All right, next slide. So the, our uh, facility is the Aitken computer and it was commissioned roughly four years ago. Uh, and it, when we first uh, put it in, we had enough, uh, enough IT just to do one row, but uh, in, since the time it's been commissioned, we've added uh, the uh, additional three or two rows sorry, for a total of three. We have um, Apollo 9000 computers, which is what you're looking at on the left screen. Uh, the, um, the module is only compute, and so disk drives are still networked to the main facility, 258, that has, has storage. Uh, and um, it's connected with uh, single mode fiber cables. And right now, Aiken, this little module on the right here, is the fastest computer at NASA. Uh, it's about 300,000 cores. Uh, and as we say, the fastest computer in a trailer. Uh, well, it used to be that I don't, when we first started doing modulars, we definitely said we were the fastest computer in a trailer. Uh, whether or not we still are, um, necessarily sure uh, and next uh, next slide so uh, like others have mentioned before um, you know when we put sustainability and operating expenses into our design uh, mainly because we pay our own electric bill uh, we're actually paying uh, 13 cents a kilowatt hour uh, and in fact we were paying as high uh, before we started getting high rainstorms here uh, last winter, we were paying as high as 31 cents a kilowatt hour. So energy savings is is significant to us, as well as water usage. California is is definitely in a drought area. Uh, we had a great rainstorm uh, season this past winter, and and so it has dropped our our energy usage costs. Uh, but we're trying to uh, be good stewards and, and keep water usage down. Uh, in addition, you know, bottom line is sustainability reduces operating expenses. So Aiken uh, runs on its 90 degree water and compared to if we had put that same 2.1 megawatt load in our uh, data center, uh, we are saving $750,000 a year. Oh, uh, in uh, energy as well as seventy thousand dollars a year in uh, in uh, uh, water, and the evaporative coolers, uh, because they are running at ninety uh, Fahrenheit, uh, they're really only running during the uh, when daytime temperatures are uh, are their warmest, and um, because we're running at ninety, we have a water usage effectiveness of uh, of point one liter per kilowatt hour. Uh, your typical data center is 1.8. And, and I can tell you our, our typical data center with, you know, uh, chillers and uh, cooling tower is exactly 1.8. So it, uh, we are saving a significant amount of water uh, just moving to, uh, to these evaporative coolers. And next slide. And I'll go as quick here. So we think modular data centers are the way to go for us. Uh, we're taking advantage of moderate temperatures with low humidity. Um, and, and I encourage those of us who are in the same type of uh, environments to look closely at modular uh, data centers. Um, obviously, if you were in Miami, Florida, you could
couldn't use evaporative coolers as well as we do, but um, modular data centers are, are still helpful because they're, they're super scalable. They're limiting the amount of money we spend up front. Uh, they're easy to modify. Um, I would say probably the biggest uh, point I would make out is though you need to make sure that your original infrastructure is, meets your goals. Um, we have uh, our original plan was to put 15 megawatts on our pad. Uh, when we found out how fast and dense compute was getting, uh, we decided to run extra conductors uh, and put all 30 megawatts to our concrete pad. Uh, it's difficult to do infrastructure like that later, uh, but when you're building something uh, spec, you could fit it in. Um, so, you know, we sit at uh, 14 feet above sea level, so we worry about uh, flooding uh, capability and earthquakes. And um, I would say building a pilot facility is helpful uh, to validate uh, your technology. And with that, I see I'm five minutes over. So I don't know. I see we do have a couple of questions. So let me take a look at those. Uh, So what happens with our computers, with the containers, once the computers are decommissioned? Um, we, uh, we haven't had that happen yet, but we do have a seven-year-old uh, one that we're probably getting to that point. Uh, and we're looking at the fact that we'll just go ahead and change out whatever electrical system might be needed. Uh, our air-cooled one has the ability to run chilled water, although we won't. So if we ever need lower air temperatures, we can get it out of that one. Uh, it'd be pretty tough to move it to a, uh, to a water-cooled system. Uh, but from the existing water-cooled systems, we feel that uh, we can go ahead and modify it pretty much as we need it to. Um, but I'll also say, you know, these things come on a truck and get loaded in with a crane and they can get taken out pretty easy too. And in comparison to what computers cost, uh, there may be 10% of the total number. So uh, it's, it's, it, they're not an expensive building just to swap out. And um, what is the current power consumption? Oh, I'll go ahead and uh, what is the, at JSC, uh, Thomas, I, I don't know if you're still on, but, uh, and how does it, so I give the question, what is the current power consumption of JSC and how does it compare to the projected 15 megawatts for Jupiter? Well, currently we are on average below four megawatts. So that includes uh, several systems, of course, and storage. Um, and yeah, you can do the math. So <laughs> 15 is megawatt is uh, about four times uh, of what we have today. Um, yeah, the second part of the question, yes, uh, I absolutely agree. And that's actually what we do. <laughs> so um, using, trying to use um, energy efficient components. So GPUs currently, I think, provide for applications that can leverage um, an excellent uh, flops per watt ratio. And then it's a question, what we also consider, which I mentioned, is the question of architecture. So that you, we, in our modular systems, we provide modules with different types of architecture and uh, users can choose the one which provides for them the best, um, the most efficient um, execution of their applications. And that is uh, also a win in, in energy efficiency. To, to have a good, well-utilized system. All right, well, thank you. And I see we have to end it here. Uh, it's time to go to the cocktail party. <laughs> oh, but, well, no, we do have a couple of uh, final thoughts. Um, okay. Um, so folks, yeah, just a few moments, uh, just two, three more minutes. Um, so, very quickly, uh, the next session is um, Natalie will be giving quick updates on the upcoming events. But but before that, just a quick 
logist, wrap up logistics, right? Again, to reiterate, uh, uh, slides and recordings will be on the event web page. Uh, but more importantly, a big shout out to all our uh, workshop committee members who really helped us over the past two months, uh, two, three months to just uh, get this to fruition. Um, Torsten and Natalie, I'm sure they'd like to convey their thanks as well. And uh, with that, over to you, Natalie. Thank you, Sid. Thanks very much. Um, okay, everybody. So I really appreciate your participation. Um, we do have some upcoming events that I'd like to talk about. Uh, the first one will be SC23. So we have a booth, a panel, and some boffs. Um, and uh, I, I've included a couple that are not actually an EEHBC working group team effort, but I think are really um, relevant to this group of people. One is there's a workshop on Sunday at eight o'clock on sustainable supercomputing. Then at Tuesday, 3.30, uh, uh, we have a panel on carbon neutrality, sustainability, and HPC. Um, and then Tuesday, uh, sorry, Tuesday at noon is a BOF uh, on first steps towards adopting direct liquid cooling HPC. Um, this then in, Tuesday night is community-driven efforts to enable unified power management HPC system stacks. Wednesday is the green 500 BOF, and then Thursday, unfortunately, there are three BOFs going on simultaneously that are all relevant to this community. One is um, modular container and pallet racking for the next generation data center. So some of the same speakers that we've had today, I think are gonna be there. Um, operational data analytics, uh, Michael Ott and uh, the ODA team are hosting uh, an, a BOF that they've hosted in the past, and that should prove to be very interesting um, and it's slightly different, I think, from modular as well as the last one, which is on heat reuse. So um, that's coming up with at SC23, and then in December, which exact date TBD, we have CSC Lumi, um, you know, the Finnish site that Otto made reference to earlier. We're going to do a showcase, a two-day showcase on their site, uh, a deep dive, you know, under the hood kind of look at um, some of the things that they're doing, like heat reuse, um, like uh, recycling their building, um, and uh, so I think that should prove to be very interesting. And uh, I hope a lot of you are able to attend. All right, that was it, Sid, thanks. Thanks to everybody. And by the way, all the presentations are already posted and the recordings from yesterday are already posted as well. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, great. Thanks, everybody. Bye.